All right, we're going to get started tonight. I appreciate everybody being here. We was unable to have service last night because of the electric being out. And uh, so I did our best to get the word out. But everybody's here except those that text or called or, or something that still without electric. And so, uh, but we're glad that you're here. This is our last class uh, for this round, for this uh, eight-week course. And uh, we're going to be on the baptism, the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so we uh, just appreciate you coming. If you would stand, we'll start with prayer. And we'll get right into it this evening. Father, we love you. And we thank you, God, for your grace and for your mercy and your love. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here one more time to teach your word. And Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, and Lord, anoint me, God, to, to help me to teach tonight, God, to rightly divide this great word of truth. And I'll be very careful to give you the praise, glory, and the honor. In the name of Jesus, we ask it, amen and amen. All right. Uh, let me remind you, this is a classroom-type setting. Um, if you got questions, we want you to ask. I'm going to do something that I hadn't done in this in this classes before, and that is to back up. Uh, uh, Pastor Brian's here also. He taught part of these classes. But I want you to back up to the beginning. Everybody got their notebook. Back up to the beginning uh, real quickly. I'm just going to take a moment, Brian, if anybody's got any questions. Uh, throughout any of this, and we try our best to answer. But back up from the very beginning, the foundation, we started with foundation class. We started uh, just giving an introduction. In the introduction, I told you about what we were going to be doing uh, and how that everything would point to what Jesus Christ has done on the cross of Calvary. We access all of that God has available to us it's been made available to us through what Jesus done on the cross, but we access that by our faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary. And that's kind of what we covered in this introduction. We tried to emphasize, and we've done it throughout this eight weeks, that it's about faith in Christ and what he's did, and that and it done accomplished. And so that's a, that's a heart question that you need as a believer to continue to ask yourself and to check yourself, check your faith to make sure that your faith is in Christ and not in your own performance or your own works. And so that's kind of how we started out. I'm going to turn to the next page. The next page is justification. Justification by faith. And justification is a doctrine that by which we are declared not guilty. We're placed in a right standing with God, and we are now prepared to be transformed into a witness for Jesus Christ. But justification uh, teaches us that God legally can declare one not guilty based upon their faith in Jesus and his finished work upon the cross of Calvary. Does anybody got any questions about justification by our faith? This is how you're saved. This is how you're declared not guilty before the Lord, and that is by our faith in Christ. Any questions on that page? All right. I'm going to move on. Slow me down, stop me, whatever you need to do. But I want to make sure we don't have any, we haven't overlooked any questions. Uh, I'll turn to the next page. My next page says sin nature defined. Has everybody got that? All right. We defined sin nature. We brought out where it is uh, mostly found, and that, that's not the only place it's found, but it's mostly identified in Romans in chapter number 6. Uh, the word sin there, every place except for verse number 15 has the direct article the in front of it, and it's talking about that nature that we inherited from Adam, uh, the, the sin nature, the desire uh, for the things of the world, the desire for sin. And so uh, sin nature, I uh, tried to define that, and we looked at some conflicting views of the sin nature. Uh, conflicting views is uh, just ignorance or denial. Or that some use it as just a, we have a license to sin and they ignore uh, sin nature altogether because of grace. We learned last week that's not what grace is for. And uh, so there's a lot of conflict in views. I'll just say this, and probably some would agree, but before I understood what Jesus done on the cross of Calvary, uh, I, I never heard term sin nature in a church service ever. I went to church all my life, and I never heard the term sin nature up till I was 26 years old. 
Anybody else in here never heard sin nature? All right. Did sin nature help you? It helped us because it understands the problem. You can't fix anything if we don't know what the problem is, and even if we know the solution, we still need to know what the problem was. This is what, how we were born. We were born with a sin nature. And once we understand sin nature, then we also can understand how to keep the sin nature dormant and not cause us uh, tremendous problems in our walk with the Lord. And so, any questions about sin nature? All right. I um, went to the next page. My next page says how we receive sin nature. I'm not going to recap a whole lot here, but he's going back to Romans chapter number 5 when it talked about us receiving sin nature through uh, Adam. When Adam fell in the garden, then we were all, bo all born into that, uh, that sin uh, consciousness, that nature to sin. And uh, so it, we, got, we looked at the contrast of what we received through Adam and then also what we received through Christ uh, by faith in Jesus and what he done for us on the cross of Calvary. I want to say this because you hear us repeat it a lot. Let me say this and I'll move along. I, I, I know a lot of people have said, you know, you don't have to say the cross all the time and you don't have to say cross all the time. And I don't even have to say uh, through Christ and what he did on the cross or his finished work. I don't have to say that every time. But you're going to hear me probably more than anybody, repeat it more than anybody, because I mean I intend for that to get in your, your spirit and in your heart because we have a lot of people that preach by faith in Jesus, but I'm, I've, I've literally heard preachers say, don't add anything to Christ. It's not Christ and the cross. It's just Christ alone. Listen, if Jesus would have come and just lived on this earth and never died, and the cross is the means that he died, salvation would not be available to us today. And so it's not just Jesus as the Son of God. It's Jesus and what he accomplished for us on the cross of Calvary. So I'm going to beat a dead horse. You're going to hear me Sunday morning, Sunday night, whenever I'm preaching, whenever I'm teaching, I am going to beat a dead horse because I want people to understand and I want to be very clear that I am preaching Christ and what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. So uh, that's how we receive sin nature is through Adam. Uh, went on. Now I'm going to look at the next page. We're just he's still explaining sin nature, personified as a king. He's talking about him reigning. He's a king in your life. When the apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 6 that you are either the servants of sin or you are the servants of righteousness. Uh, most people don't understand that, but you, you can only serve one master. And there's only two masters that we can serve, and that is the sin which is the devil or righteousness, which is Christ. Everybody in here, everybody in the world is serving one or the other. You can serve Christ by faith and if you place your faith from the heart in Jesus and what he did for you on the cross of Calvary. And even, I don't mean this in the wrong way, but even if you're a good old boy and even if you got everything, all of your, your I's dotted and all of your T's crossed, if your faith is not in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary, then the devil is your master. You got you to gotta understand that. We have, we have two masters, but we can only serve one master. That master reigns as a king in our heart, and it will either be Jesus Christ or it will be uh, the devil. So that we're there. All right, next page uh, is just a copy of chapter 6, Romans chapter 6. Everybody got that? Because uh, mine may not be in order. I take mine in and out, make copies and all kinds of stuff, so uh, I'm trying to make sure. Uh, the next page, he looked at King James Version, and then he looked at Young's Literal Version. The purpose of this page, to give you this page, is to show that the direct article, the, is in front of the word sin in Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter number 6. That It is in front of it. When it talks about the sin, it's making it a noun. It's making it the sin nature. It's what he's talking about. And so we use the Young's literal translation just as a way uh, to prove it. Young's literal translation, I want you to know, it's available to you. You can look it up online. And Young's, I love Young's because he literally just went in and made a direct word-for-word -word translation. And he will tell you in the beginning of his, tra of his commentary, of his translation, I've got one back in, the, in my office if you want to look at it. But he'll tell you, it does not take the place of your King James Version, but King James makes it where we can read it and we can understand it. The, uh, I'm not making a plug just for 
the Bible. We, we have Bibles available in the back, and we, uh, we make zero dollars, uh, not a dime, but we, we just keep them available. Our church can get a better discount than what you can get if you call because we can order them in bulk, so we make them available. Uh, but we have a Bible called the Expositor Study Bible, and uh, uh, the Expositor Study Bible takes out the Elizabethan uh, English which changes the these and thous to you and your and just puts it to where we read it. It doesn't change the scripture, doesn't change the text, it just puts it to where we read it. And so uh, the King James Version, again, we went over that. It's very important that you look at that, that you study with that. And I'm not going to argue with somebody that another version is not the word of God. I'm not here for that. But I'm just telling you, uh, Young's will help you get a direct translation. It's hard to read. It is hard to read. King James is not hard to read when you understand uh, the message, and so that's why that page is in there. My next page, the heading of it is Faith Without Works is Dead. Everybody got that? Everybody, we're still on the same page. Good. Faith Without Works is Dead. We, made, we brought this into perspective. A lot of uh, Bible scholars said that James, the writer of James, who was James, was not in harmony with the rest of the New Testament and said that it shouldn't, some, some would argue and say it shouldn't even be included because here comes James bringing in that your faith must have works. And the, and the Apostle Paul, 14 epistles, he's talking about faith and faith alone. In fact, he would go as far as to say that show me your faith without your works. And so uh, we, when James come in and said faith without works, what James was doing, he was not adding a new doctrine and he wasn't trying to put in your performance. He's just trying to say that proper faith will produce proper works. And if you, if you truly believe, then your life will reflect what you believe in your heart. All right? Faith without works is dead. So everybody got that? Any questions about faith without works? All right, we're doing good. We'll move right along. The next page, he's just bringing that out more. He goes to Galatians, teaches a little bit more about and goes into the fruit of the Spirit. But faith without works is dead. And, and if we have faith, it ought to be producing the fruit of the Spirit. And so that's where uh, that is at. My next page is sanctification. Are you everybody there? Page of sanctification. If you have a question here, I'll bring Pastor Brian up and he can answer this. But the word uh, sanctification literally means to purify. It means to clean us. Even though we're saved, we still have some things that needs to be changed in our life. And the purification process is our daily walk with the Lord. And it is our changing process. And so sanctification by definition is our work of grace. It is the divine influence of the Holy Spirit. And the Apostle Paul uh, refers to this as our walk before the Lord. And so uh, he looked at standing in state. Everybody understand standing in state? Questions? All right. Sanctification, he went on in uh, to how that it varies up and down, our walk with the Lord. Uh, but we keep walking. God will keep changing as long as our faith is in Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary. Now, I don't know, I don't remember us going into great detail here. Uh, and maybe uh, he did on, these, on the pictures, the justification, sanctification pictures. Did you uh, bring them up and show them or did we just include them? All right, we included them in your booklet to show uh, exactly what happens. My next, my picture is justification, sanctification. Everybody got that? Justification, sanctification. Everybody got that? You got that, Miss Tracy? Okay. All right, and it just shows what happens when we're justified. Start at the bottom and justify justified salvation we are placed in Christ to give you a picture of Christ and it talks about uh, that justification is a one-time event the reason we bring that out is uh, I know some of my Pentecostal friends might disagree but we do believe that once you are saved you are always saved as long as you keep your faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary we do believe that you can come to the place where you no longer believe and if you no longer believe, then, you know, we're saved by faith and we have, to, we have to keep our faith in order to stay in Christ. And if you quit believing in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary, then, uh, then there is a, that's when you're in danger of losing your salvation. Now, I brought this out just a little bit last week and I hope there was no confusion, but I believe and I, I'll teach it. I, uh, and I, if I need to go into it a little bit more, I will, but... We believe that you can be in a backslidden condition 
and also still be in a justified position. Does that make sense? Everybody understand that? You don't want to be there because if you're in a backslidden condition, you have stopped going forward. Before you can get out of the field, you first got to stop going forward. So stopping going forward is your intermediate. That is your step before uh, you quit believing upon Jesus. You don't want to be there. But let me tell you something. I, I didn't understand this for a long time, but God loves us too much to just throw us away the first time that we get a little frustrated or we get a little, that we set back a little bit, he's not just going to throw you away. When you, get, when you get in a situation, look, life will throw us situations that we don't always understand. And the first thing we do as believers, and everybody in here may not admit this, but the first thing we do as believers is in our heart, we start to question God. We start, we want to know what's going on. Because we believe that God is able to take care of everything and God is able to bless us. We look at a blessing God. We look at and we know God is a God that loves us and a God that is able to take care of every situation. So the moment we have a problem and we're serving God and all we're doing is loving God and our family's a mess or our family's a wreck, the first thing we want to do is we want to blame God to an extent and say, God, what's going on? Why didn't you fix this? But listen. God's not going to, because you have to sit back and think a little while, because you have to cross your arms or scratch your head and you're just, you're at a point in your life where you're having a hard time going forward, thank God he didn't throw you away. He didn't throw you away, but he's giving, he's, having, he's a patient God. He's still dealing with us. He's still moving upon our heart. He's still pulling at our heart. And so, again, I, I know uh, Brother Michael brought it up last time, and I know I preached it, but it's okay to camp at the altar for a little while if you need to camp at the altar. Just don't, just don't leave the altar. Camp at the altar. It's okay to tell God, uh, you, look, you're not going to catch God off guard if you say, God, I'm having trouble with this. I'm not wanting to go forward. I'm having a problem here. You didn't catch God off guard. It's all right to talk to him like that. Because God will be patient with you. God will still pull at you. And God will give you time until you are ready to move on and move forward. And so uh, we're in Christ and we believe that we stay in Christ as long as, and it's a heart question, as long as our faith is in Jesus and what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. Any questions about that picture? All right, my next picture says spiritual adultery. Is everybody there? Spiritual adultery. I may be out of line, but find the out of order. Am I out of order, Brian? Okay, spiritual adultery is, does everybody got that? Everybody's flipping the paper, so I probably got an extra one y'all don't got. Okay, you don't got the spiritual adultery. All right, you got it. Okay, salvation in Christ is what I uh, have. The spiritual adultery will be a great one to to make. Yeah, it's in that folder there. Uh, but salvation in Christ. Let's look at that, and then we'll come back. He'll have it. He'll have it uh, printed off, and we'll look at that other one. Salvation in Christ. We look at justification. The picture is the little stick man. By faith in the cross, he's looking to the cross. Sanctification, the stick man, you got him taking a step forward. He's living by faith in the cross, and he got scriptures underneath there. And look, I encourage you to go home uh, to look at these and, and, to, uh, and to study. You need to, you need to have uh, this reinforced as much as what we can. And then glorification, which is the third part of our salvation process, is literally that will happen when we take on a glorified body. Now, me and uh, Pastor Brian, we, we had a little bit of a discussion about this, and we come to the conclusion because we used to think that the moment you take your last breath is when you receive the third part, which is glorification, uh, the third part of our salvation. But the truth of the matter is we don't receive glorification until Jesus comes back. 
Okay, we believe that when you die, that your spirit and your soul goes to be with the Lord if your faith is in Christ. But the body awakes the resurrection. There will be a resurrection of, uh, of, the, of, of both of the saved and the unrighteous. There will be a resurrection of both. But when the Apostle Paul talked about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he doesn't mention Gabriel, and it makes it special to me because I've heard it all my life that Gabriel is going to blow this trumpet here. But here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says that the Lord Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the trump of God. And the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and then we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up together to be with him, and forever we shall be with the Lord. And says to comfort one another with these words. Now, look, that tells me Jesus is the one coming back, and Jesus is the one going to shout with the voice of a trumpet. Look, at this moment is when we, our body, will be changed, and this, in, this mortal will put on immortal, and this corruptible will put on incorruption, and we will receive our glorified body which is the last part of our salvation uh, experience. Pastor Brian, if you could to bring up the uh, look up, you can use my idea if you need to, but I want to, as she's passing this out. Uh, but I want to show you uh, the scripture where we brought, we've now have the first fruits, only the first fruits of what the Lord has paid for on the cross. I want to say that those that are watching live, we're going a little bit slow right now if you're tuned in, but we want to bring some things out and recap this being the final uh, being the final class, and so give us just a moment. We're passing out another handout right now. Okay, I want to show you Romans 8 and 23. Megan can bring that up for us, and you can look at it. Uh, but Romans 8 and 23 talks about uh, the first fruits that we have received from God because of our faith in Christ and what he did on the cross. He says, not only they, but our ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of the body. When it talks about groaning within ourselves, it literally talking about every believer in here ought to have a longing, a longing to receive everything that Jesus paid for, a longing to be with him in heaven. You know, we have, a, we have fear, we have some fear of death because it's something we haven't ever experienced. But when we start talking about Jesus coming back in the clouds and start talking about a place with no more sickness and no more sorrow and no more death, there ought to be something that rises up in you because your flesh is groaning, it is longing for its maker. And so we only have the first fruits of the Spirit, which is a justification going through the process of sanctification, but we have not yet been glorified. And we will receive that when God, when the Lord himself comes back to receive us unto him. Any questions there? All right, let's back up to spiritual adultery. I know you got it now. I've just seen them give it to you. Spiritual adultery talks about legally the believer is married to Christ, but is in spiritual adultery with law frustrating uh, God's sanctifying grace. The position of Christ under grace, is this is Jesus and the believer is Christ. The believer has improper faith in, when we talk about spiritual adultery and is in a cursed union if we try to revert back to law. Now let me tell you this. When your Bible talks about law, this is what law is. Law required works. Law required works. So when we talk about law, we're talking about works. And what that means is this. I'm a married man. For me to step out of my marriage covenant, go and go to another woman for her to provide anything that my wife can provide for me, then I have committed adultery. Everybody understand that? That's adultery. All right, when it comes to spiritual adultery, I'm married to Jesus, uh, to Jesus Christ and him alone. I have come into this union. I talked about it when two shall become one. I have come into this union, and it's a miracle that is taking place in my life. Well, this union is literally that Jesus is able to provide for me anything and everything everything that I will need in this life in order to make it. Everything that God has provided for me, he made available through Jesus Christ. And now that I'm in a union with Christ, I go to Jesus and by faith in him and what he did for me on the cross of Calvary, I receive everything that I need. I don't need to step out. Now here's where law and works will intertwine. I do not need to step out of faith and grace. 
That's the covenant that Jesus left with us. Don't step out of faith and grace. If I'm saved by faith, Colossians 2 and 6, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. If I'm saved by faith, then I also walk by faith. And here's what that means. You don't need to revert to a self-help program in order to be changed or to be free from something. What I revert to is what I, the way I started. I placed my faith in Jesus and what he did for me on the cross of Calvary and the power of the Holy Spirit that baptized me in Christ when I was born again is the same power that comes to deliver me. And sometimes it takes a little while, little by little, but rest assured if I keep my faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary, that anything and everything that I need from God is made available to me by simple faith and faith alone. Now here's where we bring this out. It always raises a few eyebrows. But listen. Reading your Bible. Your prayer time. Your fasting. Do we say this is regular actions of the believer? Being faithful to the house of God. It is regular actions of the believer. But here's where we bring in the heart question. If you think that increasing your Bible reading alone. Is going to merit you something with God, and God's got a check mark because today instead of three chapters, you read five. That's going to merit you something with God. Then what you've done is you've moved your faith from Jesus and what he did on the cross to my performance, even if it's in my Bible reading. Do you understand that? When really and truly my Bible reading, my prayer, my fasting ought to increase my faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary, not in myself. That's why we, we, you look at it, it's one of the, it's, it is the fastest, not just fastest growing, but it's the largest false doctrine in the world today is the false doctrine of the word of faith doctrine. And what they emphasize on their, their foundation is absolutely horrible. Their foundation, it couldn't be more off scripture than anything in the world but when you look at their what they're doing is they are they are pointing you to your performance because it's all about your proper confession and a right confession and all about uh, they believe if you're sick don't say you're sick because you'll bring that upon yourself look if you go to the doctor and the doctor says you're sick or you got this and then your family member asks you what the doctor said and then you say I'm not sick it doesn't make you holy that makes you a liar because you are a proper confession is, well, the doctor said I've got this, but I'm going to believe God to touch my body. I'm going to trust the Lord to touch my body. What word, word of faith does is they turn your, from faith in Christ and what he did on the cross to faith in your words and faith in your proper confession. Everybody understand that? And the moment that you move your faith from Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary, bottom part of this, you frustrate, or the top part, you frustrate the grace of God. You cut off Galatians 2 and 21. You frustrate the grace of God. You cut off the only help that you have. And I'm not going to tell you that you're not saved, but I am going to tell you if you're trusting in what you do from your confession to your Bible reading to your fasting to your prayer to your self-help to your 40 days to your 12 step, if you're trusting in in anything than what Jesus done for you on the cross of Calvary and you are saved you're miserably saved you are miserably saved and so uh, any questions about what I've said I just said a mouthful but any questions everybody understand that if you if you don't understand now's the time I'll pull out the old wedding day saying speak now or forever hold your peace no I don't mind if you come later I just want you to ask are there any questions at all? Everybody good? Everybody understand where we're at? Okay. All right. Last page. Okay. Go ahead. That's right. Mm -mm. No, there can't be. And that's a, that is a good question for everybody in this class, everybody watching to keep in mind. You're going to talk to people that has different ideas about the scripture and about the text. I don't believe that anybody, everybody, or anybody has everything figured out exactly. But I do know that the message of the cross, the foundation of what Jesus done on the cross of Calvary is line upon line, 
and precept upon precept because it's bringing everything together. I dare to say that those that have sat through this class that doesn't really, that hasn't really understood the message of the cross, there's some things starting to click in your mind and click in your heart and starting to come together. Amen? That's what we want. That's, what, that's why we're doing what we're doing. But here's a good question that you can ask when you're talking to people about the Bible, and they're starting to tell you, well, this is why uh, this is, why this is, and this is why you're wrong or whatever. Pay close attention to if they move from the foundation of faith in Christ and what he did on the cross. Pay close attention. Because it, we are so easily removed from it that a lot of times it's not hard to recognize when somebody's trying to lay it out. I don't know how many times when I've talked to see people about Scripture and they're trying to explain to me, you know, uh, their thought, their beliefs, or whatever. And I'll, I'll, I'll sit and debate. I love to talk to Scripture. I'm not the guy that's got it all figured out. And there's sometimes I've had to say, I don't know. But we'll look it up and we'll, we'll, we'll we're going to, you know, I want to know. So we're going to, we're going to look it up. But I love to debate scripture, but I don't know how many times that I have had to look at somebody and say, sir, you've just left the foundation. You have found, you have left the foundation. I asked somebody, here's a great question. Tell me how to have victory in my life. You tell me how that I am to have victory in my life. And quickly, most every believer will tell you what you need to do. And very few will tell you what to believe. And, and very quickly, I can say, uh, you've left the foundation. I asked a young man one time uh, how I'll have victory, and he said, well, we believe it's a combination of three things. And I said, no, sir. You want to hear the three things? I said, no, I don't. Because two of them, at least two of them are wrong. Because there's not three of them. There's faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary. I know I've made reference before, but Brother Greg gave his testimony here a couple of Sunday nights ago. Been through rehabs, been through uh, the different hospitals. He'd been through different kinds of helps and uh, different programs. And all he did was cried out to the Lord in the parking lot. And guess what Jesus did? He said, that's what I've been waiting on. The power of the Holy Ghost moved upon in his truck, upon his heart. And that's what, that's what the answer is. Faith in Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary. I love what he said. And he, he didn't say a lot, but he said something that I'll never forget. Me and Pastor Brian has talked about several times. He said, if I'd ever got free in a rehab or in a hospital, it would have been me doing it and not the Lord doing it. Look, I don't care how strong your willpower is. Willpower will take you far enough to set you up for a fall that you might not recover from. You might not recover from. Because when it comes to willpower, willpower is not how power. And the how is my faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary. We got to have the help of the Holy Spirit. Any other, any questions? Anything else? All right, let's look at this last sheet. The work of the Holy Spirit. Going to look at baptism of the Holy Spirit. I don't have a lot of time, but I'm, I'm going to get to the gist of this. And, uh, and conclude it tonight. And again, if you've got any questions, uh, then we want you to look at them questions. Uh, we want you to ask the questions. I want to start off by saying that, I, you know, I was raised in a Pentecostal church. I thank God for that. I thank God for my Pentecost experience. But as I was growing up, I never really understood the purpose of the Pentecost of, of, besides being in a church service. I, let me just say this. I did not know and understand that the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was for my individual relationship with Christ first. Before the gifts of the Spirit are to edify the body. Edify, don't let that be a big word. That simply means to build you up in the faith. The gifts of the Spirit are to build the faith of the body. But the baptism of the Spirit is to empower us to be. It's empower us to be what God has called us to be. And the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for everybody. In the Pentecostal church, I have seen, I have sat next to people or behind people at a restaurant that I knew were Pentecost. I knew they were Pentecost because I knew them. And, and I want to duck my head because they were so mean to the waitress when they come over there to take their order. So help them. Don't get one single thing. If I want everything in the entire world on my pizza except for olives 
And I see a little bitty speck of an olive on there, and it's just, whew. Well, you're not helping nobody, and nobody's going to want to have what you have because you're ugly and you're mean. I don't care if you do speak in tongues. But what I've seen, I didn't see, I didn't, I'm not telling you people I went to church with was mean, but what I've seen growing up was people that were baptized in the Spirit. They spoke in another tongue, but a lot of times is in the flesh. A lot of times was out of order. And look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, Cast stones because any time that we are learning about the ways of God and the gifts of God, then we're going to get in the flesh a little bit because we got to learn. I understand that. But it's when it's continued and then it's praised and then it's commended on the way of God, then I've got a problem with that. Because I believe in order and reverence and I believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Look, what I want you to know is this. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just for Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for your individual benefit first. And then it can filter or mature into the gifts of the Spirit and be used by God uh, in every area. Let me say this about the gifts, and I'm not here uh, to teach on the gifts tonight, but I want to say this about gifts. The gifts of the Spirit. I've had people say, well, I've got this gift, or I've got this gift, or I've got this gift. Don't get caught up in that. I know that people are used in in different gifts more than other gifts. But if you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then you've got the foundation or the base for God the Holy Spirit to work any and every gift through you as he so needs to do so. It's like making cookies or making cake or making biscuit. You can't do that without flour. But if you got flour, you can go in many different, no, I'm not a ship, but you can go in many different directions, all right? If you got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God can use that. Uh, in a lot of different directions, okay? All right. The greatest gift, I'm in our, on our paper, the greatest gift ever given to the world is salvation. Absolutely. No second-class Christian, even if you've not been baptized into the Spirit. No second-class Christian. The greatest gift ever given to the church is the baptism of the Holy Spirit or into the Spirit. And, and we'll read about that in just a minute. The first thing I want you to understand about the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that you need to keep it simple. Don't let the enemy make it a complicated subject. If Jesus provided the infilling of the Spirit for our benefit, why would any believer ever reject this great gift? I don't understand that. I've had people, me and Pastor Brian sat down with with someone one time, and they said we were talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he about half snickered, and we wasn't near as sanctified, so we were getting a little bit, you know, uprising in our spirit at the time. And we, and he said, I got all of the spirit that I want. Well, my first thought is, are you saved? How does anybody get any bit of the Lord and say, I've got all I want? Jesus, the word says, taste and see that he is good. And once you get a taste of him, you'll want more and more and more of him. And so uh, I don't want any more. I, I, gotta, I, I have to ch- uh, checkmate right there because something's wrong. Now, three baptisms in Scripture. I'm not going to look these up. I'll give you examples, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to go there right now. We have the baptism into Christ. We have baptism into water. We have baptism into spirit. Baptism into Christ is what happens when you first put your faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into Jesus Christ. We're now in the body. Baptism into water is a teaching of Scripture. It is an outward show of something that already happened on the inside. It is a testimony to everybody that the old man has been buried in Christ, symbolized by the water, and been raised up as a new creation in Jesus Christ. That is baptism in the water. Let me tell you something. We, I know a lot of churches, I've had people... I've had people uh, put more emphasis on water baptism than what there should be. Again, the only common denominator that you find from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is faith. And what are we looking at faith in? We're looking at faith in the sacrifice. And we're saved the same way that Abraham was. Genesis 15 and 6, Abraham believed the Lord and it was accounted to him by uh, for righteousness. It's never changed. We are saved by faith. You're not saved by water baptism. Yes, I believe you ought to be water baptized. And if you haven't never been water baptized, then my question is why not? Why haven't you been water baptized? But there is no salvation in water baptism. 
You wouldn't believe, you know, maybe you would, the emphasis that some churches put on water baptism. And then they go as far as to say you've got to be water baptized in a certain formula or a certain way in order to be saved. Do you know that water baptism, you're dependent upon a man? Unless you can stand right here and do a sit-up after you go underwater, and I doubt you can, you're dependent upon a man. But you know the Lord would have died and saved you if you were the only person ever created. I got to tell this, I know I got a little bit of time and then I'll move on. But here's how far some of the church goes. I literally know, I literally know because I talked to them, I was lost for words. My mouth dropped. My face doesn't do very good about hiding expressions sometimes. And so I don't know what they were thinking, but I just walked off before my mouth got me in trouble. But I literally know a church that called an evangelist to come preach a revival for them. The man came in to preach a revival. The pastor called him trusted him with his pulpit to preach a revival for him. Went fishing the day before the revival started that night. When they got to talk and learn the guy had not been baptized in Jesus' name. Convinced the man that they called as an evangelist to come preach a revival, convinced him that he wasn't saved. And got out of the boat in the river and baptized him in Jesus' name and let him go ahead and preach the revival. Now come on. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. You're saved by faith in Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary. We don't have to unplug somebody on their deathbed and take them and find water and baptize them if they say yes to Jesus. I know I talked about it, but last Friday, look, I got the call Sunday morning at 5 o'clock. My cousin had passed on into glory. But last Friday, me and him sat on the side of the bed. We didn't have to unhook him. We didn't have to do anything. He wept and he accepted Jesus as his Savior. There's no doubt in my mind where he's at today. No doubt in my mind at all. I'm thankful for justification by our faith. Baptism into water, and then there's baptism into the Spirit. And we give you three examples there, and we're talking about baptism into Spirit tonight. The truth is, you don't have to be baptized into the Spirit to go to heaven. So the question in the hearts of many today is, what is the purpose and what is the benefit? Why do I need it if I don't need to go to heaven? And there's many, look, we're still dealing today with a, a uh, charismatic response or a, uh, let me say, a bad taste in people's mouth, if I can say it like that. All of us in here probably know somebody that don't want to go to church, go to the Pentecostal church because they had a bad experience in a Pentecostal church. I had a lady cut my hair one time and say, we was talking about church. Do you speak in tongues in your church? I said, yes, ma'am. And I speak in tongues in my barn, and I speak in tongues in my truck, and I speak in tongues if I'm on my horse. If I'm praying and I'm going to pray in the Spirit, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, it's part of my life. It's part of my prayer life. But didn't want to go. It scares me to death. You know what? The moving of the Holy Spirit shouldn't scare anybody. It ought to draw people. And so if it scared somebody, something has been out of line. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, we've not learned what the purpose, we've not learned the benefit, so many people have just brushed it off and doesn't desire this great gift that God has left the church. I'm going to move on in my paper because we got, uh, for the sake of time, the baptism of the Spirit, listen, it is not the answer for sin. And we grew up thinking that. Once you got baptized in the Holy Spirit, you've arrived. Brother Troy, same thing. Once you got baptized in the Spirit, you've arrived. Now you are a polished Christian. I've had people tell me, well, if they just go on and get the baptism of the Spirit, they wouldn't have to worry about all of that anymore. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is not interest in the heaven. And as long as we're on this earth, we're going to have some things that's going to bother us and we're going to, have to, we're going to be worried about. We're going to be concerned about. And so uh, uh, it's not the answer for sin. It's not to make you shout and make you dance and be a powerhouse. These are common thoughts in the Pentecostal church today. And let me tell you this, and I don't mean to be unkind, but, the, but Pentecost is not a dress code either. It's not a dress code. People ask me, what are you? And they're talking about denomination. You know, I don't come out with Pentecost because if I say Pentecost, they, the next question is, your wife wear long dresses, you don't have a television in your house. When you say Pentecost, that is the general census of the community today. And so I say I am a Christian. I'm a believer, and I do believe in the experience. I'm Pentecost by experience, but I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. That's what I am. But uh, uh, the, the Pentecost is not a dress code. That's not what Pentecost is, to, is at all. His first work, and I'm talking about when I say his, I'm talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in our, in our paper here. 
His first work is to regenerate us and sanctify us. We cover both of them. And to reprove us. In John chapter 16, verses 7 through 15, he talks about uh, for the, when the Comforter comes. I'm going to read that. I've got time to do that. Let's look at John uh, 16 and 7, uh, starting at verse number 7. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I do want to look at it. He says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now we asked this last time, but I want to ask it again. Do you remember what the word expedient is? What's it mean? It means more profitable. And why would it be more profitable for the Holy Spirit to be here than Jesus himself? Here's why it's more profitable. Because when God the Holy Spirit came to this earth, he made the Godhead omnipresent, which is everywhere at one time. Jesus was concealed to flesh only where he was at. Just like I'm here tonight. I'm not a Jonesboro also. I'm here. All right? That's what Jesus was. He couldn't be everywhere at one time. But when God the Holy Spirit stepped out of heaven, he's everywhere at one time. We can be having a moving of God right here, and they can be having one in Africa at the same time. That's powerful. Okay, so that's what you need to know. It's expedient. It's more profitable, and that's why it's more profitable. He said, if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Why couldn't he come? Because Christ hadn't died on the cross yet. Again, everything revolves around what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. Verse number 8, we'll move along. When he's come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment, of sin, because they believe not on me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Simply means he's going to prove he convicts us individually in the heart. He'll prove to you what is sin, anything that offends God. He will prove to you what is right. We'll know what is right, and he will prove to us there's a judgment coming. That's always there. Judgment's coming. If we don't follow after his way. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. They couldn't bear them then because the Holy Spirit had not yet come. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth is, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. We'll stop right there. The spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth. That's what his job is. That is grace. Divine influence. Of the Holy Spirit. This is his first work. Divine influence of the Holy Spirit and the reflection in one's heart. That's what he's trying to do for us today. All right? If your faith is in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary. The second work, and that's what we want to talk about tonight. I've spent so much time, I've got 10 minutes to talk about this. Second work is to equip us for service. Service, that's the purpose. In this, we also see the importance. I'm going to let. Uh, Megan bring these up because she can bring them up uh, quicker than what we can turn there but I want you to see this and you can take notes however you want to do Acts 1 and 4 first I want you to see this the importance we're looking at importance Acts 1 and 4 he tells them being assembled together with them he commanded them I want you to see that Jesus is with the disciples. This is the setting, and this is what he does. He commands them. Commanding is not a suggestion, okay? It's a must. So Jesus commands them. Everybody got that? Here's the commandment. They should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, said, you have heard of me. He heard of it because Jesus taught about him. We just read John 16. He taught. That's one place he taught, okay? Here's the setting. Jesus had been dead, buried, resurrected. The disciples never been more excited about the gospel because their king that they claimed as king has now rose from the dead. It's never happened before. There was no doubt in their mind that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. They preached, they taught, they healed, they delivered before, but now they're ready for their ministry. Everybody with me? You understand that? They'd never been more excited. They couldn't have been. And Jesus says... And they're in the midst of excitement, in the midst of their readiness to go and to, to set the world on fire. He says, I want you to go and wait. I don't want you to do anything. 
Don't do anything. Just go to Jerusalem and you wait. As fired up as what they was, the baptism of the Holy Spirit being endued with power was so important that Jesus did not want them to step out without being endued with power. Okay? See importance? I don't have this one down, but if we went to Acts chapter 5, I used it last week. Stephen, when the, when the, the disciples was, used, was looking for a person to take care of the daily ministration, find us a man full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. Another part of the importance. Look at Acts 1 and 8. If I'm going too quick, slow me down. I, I, I'm wanting to cover this ground, and I know i got a little time. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and in the uttermost part of the earth. These places are listed because that was the places that he intended for salvation to go first with the Jewish people. But watch this. Holy Ghost has come upon you. You're going to receive power. That word power is miraculous reproducing power. The intent was for the church to reproduce the works of Christ, salvation first, but the works of Christ. You shall receive miracle work and reproducing power through you. When a preacher or teacher stands up and is preaching under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we see as Jesus stood up in the synagogue in Luke chapter number 4, and they all were amazed and marveled, and they fixed their eyes upon them. That's what the Holy Spirit ought to do through them. And so I, I believe it with all of my heart. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is essential. And you shall, watch this, you shall, it doesn't say you shall do. It says you shall be. You shall be witnesses. That word witness is not a vocal witness, but it is a witness my life should be a witness. My life should be a witness of the reproductive power of Jesus Christ working through me, okay? Does that make sense? All right. I want to go, you don't have it down. You can look at this as an example. Uh, I'm going to let her bring up the book of Judges, chapter 14 and verse number 6, because I want to show you an Old Testament example real quickly. You can look along with us on the screen. I'm going to go ahead and read it. The Bible says, talking about Samson here, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. I want you to show, show you this. When Samson was walking down the trail, a baby, or a young lion came upon him, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he ripped it as a baby lamb because of the power of God upon him, okay? Now we see this again. Judges, look at uh, 14 and 19. Judges 14 and 19, talking about Samson again. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them and took their spool and gave change of garments unto them which he expounded the riddle, and his anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. How did he do this? The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. One more example, because I want you to look them up later, and that's Judges 15 and verse number 4. Judges 15 and verse number 4. Samson went, caught 300 wool foxes, took firebrands. Oh, I'm in the wrong. Judges 14. Judges 15 and 14, maybe. Here we are. And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arm became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed off his hands. The reason I bring these up is, we talked about it a little bit last week, the power of the Spirit has always been. But in the Old Testament, it was always to come upon them to perform a certain task that was greater than what they was, but it couldn't dwell with them. What is the text, Brian? John 16, I just read it. John 16 and, is it 10 or 11? Well, uh, yeah. Mm, I thought I just read it in John 16. John 16 and 10, try that. Not it. Try uh, 12 or 13. 
or both? Let's play a guessing game here. Nope. 13. Still not it. I don't know about the Texas I'm looking for. All right. Pastor Brian, I'll look for it uh, real quickly. But the Old Testament examples is that the power of the Holy Spirit would come upon them to perform a certain task, but it could not dwell in them like it could dwell in them today. And, and I got to bring that, we got to bring that scripture out before we move on. If we look at John, uh, let me look at this. It's not John 7 as we thought. It's John 16. Uh, let's see here. All right, I'll give him some time and to find this. He dwells with you, but shall dwell in you. You know the text I'm looking for? All right. All right, he'll find that. Let's move on. Acts 1 and 4, Acts 1 and 8 records the birth of the church after the early church was baptized into the Spirit. If we, look at a, if we look at a common pattern in the book of Acts, a common pattern in the book of Acts is, okay, let's bring that up real quick, and then we can move on. Everybody's minds is on that. Here we go. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But watch this. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be, future tense, shall be in you. Everybody see that? He dwelt with them, but he couldn't dwell in them as he can now because Jesus had not yet died on the cross of Calvary. Now, I feel a lot better now that we've got that out of the way. We can move on. So as a pattern in the early church, and everybody give me about five minutes, I promise I'll be done. As an early, a pattern in the early church, we see that they were preaching salvation, they were preaching Christ, People were being saved, and here's what they did. Have you received since you believed? They preached salvation. Have you received since you believed? Have you received since you believed? You know what they were doing? They were doing exactly as Jesus had commanded Ananias when he prayed for the apostle Paul, go lay your hands upon him. He will receive his sight, and I'm going to fill him with the Holy Ghost because he's a chosen vessel for me. They got saved, and they began to seek for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so that is a that is a... That is a pattern that we ought to uh, follow today. Now, I'm going to say something. Some can disagree, but because uh, I've always had people disagree, and that's okay. I'm not saying this is right, but I believe that because of the pattern of the book of Acts, that most likely the New Testament was intended for spirit-filled believers because this is what they did to every church. a preached salvation. Have you received since you believed? Because I believe that there's some things that we understand that are more enlightened after that we have been endued with this power. Uh, and, and I'll give you a scripture in regards to that. But my, my intent is to leave with you that it is important that you see the great need for this great gift and that you desire to be baptized into the Holy Spirit. Now here, I asked a couple of questions. What's the purpose? What's the benefit? Here's your purpose, your benefit. Isaiah 28, 11, and 12. Isaiah the prophet prophesied, and he was to talk, when he was talking about the outpouring of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he said, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. Verse number 12. To whom he said, watch this, This is the rest wherewith we may cause the weary to rest, and this is refreshing. Yet they would not hear. When it says they would not hear, they wouldn't accept him as Savior, let alone accept the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But what he says here about the baptism or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is that it would be rest and it would be refreshing. The Word of God talks about our, uh, our, uh, see, our walk with God. It talks about it in at least two different ways. We're in this race. We're, walk, we're running a race. It also talks about a fight of faith. I don't care if you're racing or if you're fighting. There will come a time when you need a rest. There will come a time when you need a rest. 
The baptism, the power of the Holy Spirit is rest and is refreshing. I don't mean to teach or preach just from experience, but just a personal experience. I have been at a place where uh, just where I was just completely, I've been pastoring for, I don't know, for pastoring for uh, two or three years or, or four or five years and just be at a place where you want to throw your hands up and quit because so many things are coming from so many different directions. And I have learned that the baptism of the Holy Spirit didn't have nothing to do with the church. It didn't have nothing to do with my relationship with the board or anybody else. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because I was endued with power, sitting at home by myself with nobody else around, waiting till my wife left and got in the presence of God and began to pray in the Spirit, that all of a sudden my spirit is rested and refreshed and I was embarrassed to have thoughts that I wanted to quit before because now instead of thinking about quitting and giving up, I'm thinking about, uh, I'm excited about ministry, I have a new zeal, I have a new fire, I have a new readiness to be about the work of God. God, that's the power, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It can rest and refresh you when you are wanting to quit and wanting to give up. Look, when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary and the veil was rent from top to bottom, he gave us access into the Holy of Holies. You don't got to go through me. You don't got to go through Pastor Brian. You don't got to go through a priest. You can simply say in the name of Jesus and get alone. And let me tell you something. God, the Holy Spirit, will pull you into the presence of God and when you get out of the, when you step out of the presence of God because we got to go about our life then you will be rested and refreshed and ready to go on and take on another giant it's it's a great benefit that's the purpose that's refreshing I want to tell you this yes we pray in the spirit at church Yes, we desire the gifts to be used in the church. Yes, we, we believe we're going to preach and we're going to teach baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I don't preach and teach baptism of the Holy Spirit so that you can be something that we don't need to be when we come back to church. I preach and I teach it so that when you're all alone and you're by yourself, that you have this great benefit of being rested and refreshed to help you along your journey. And if you live for God any amount of time at all, you have learned, I need a little help along this journey journey sometime and so rest and refreshing is a great benefit that's to you all right first corinthians 10 and 13 we're going to bring that up first corinthians 10 and 13 everybody in here tonight is you may not be baptized in the spirit but you live for god for a little while and this has been a, a very common scripture that has been uh recited or been repeated many times you've heard it several times that God will not put more on you than what you can bear? All right, well, that's not all of the story. There are no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. How many glad God is faithful tonight? He will not suffer you or allow you to be tempted above that you are able. The other night I was talking about spiritual growth. Spiritual growth and your roots growing in the Lord. We start off as a grain as a mustard seed. Well, little by little, them roots grew. Little by little, them roots begin to expand. And so when he talks about it, it doesn't suffer you uh, to be, uh, uh, suffer you above what you are able. He's not going to allow a storm like we've had in a natural storm this last couple of days. He's not going to allow a wind that is stronger than what your root system is. But let me tell you something. He will allow a wind to come to make you think, I'm not going to be able to stand. So that you will cling to the Lord by faith a little longer and them roots go to growing, he'll push you, but he's not trying to, he's not going to allow you to be more than what you are able to, to stand. Watch this. Allow you to be tempted or could be trials above that you are able. Not going to do it above what you're able. But watch this. With the temptation, with the temptation, it's a package deal. He's also going to make a way for you to escape that you may be able to bear it. And one of the great ways that you, when I make a way that uh, to escape, that I can bear it. Do you know all the times that I was rested and refreshed when I wanted to quit and got in the presence of God, and then here comes rest and refreshing, and I'm in the, I, I'm praying in the Spirit. Do you know all of them times I got up and all of a sudden I, my problem didn't change, my circumstances hadn't changed, 
But what did change is before I was rested and refreshed, I didn't think I could bear it. And now I came out thinking, you know what? I can handle this. With the help of the Lord, I'm going to be able to bear it. This is what he does. This is a great benefit of the power of the Holy Spirit. He made you a way of escape. Take advantage of it. Don't sit uh, and say, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. Say, God, I'm not going to make it without your help. I need a little help. And here comes the power of the Holy Spirit. In John 7, 37 through 39, and I'll hush. I took you way too long tonight. 7, 37 through 39, he says this. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him, watch this, should. If you believe on Jesus, you should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Again, pointing us to the cross. All of it hinged upon what Jesus would do for us on the cross of Calvary. But John 37 through 39, again, he's telling us, if you believe, then you should receive. If you believe, then you should receive the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Any questions? We barely scratched the surface, but that's all I want to do. I want to keep it simple. Any questions or comments? Well, I want to leave you with the, with, with the prayer. I'm going to pray. I want to leave you with a prayer that, that you desire to be baptized into the Holy Spirit, not to do something. I, I don't mean this in an unkind way, but in the Pentecostal church, it's went charismatic a lot of ways. And, and it's made it distasteful to people. It has been distasteful to people. To be honest with you, some of the things that I've seen and experienced as a child, I don't, I don't blame people for not wanting to be a part of that. I don't blame them. I don't want to be a part of it. I'm not going to be a part of that. Y'all will, if you're here very long at all, you'll notice that I'm, I'm big on order and reverence, but that goes both ways. If the power of the Holy Spirit is moving upon you to worship, then you're wrong if you don't worship. But the power of the Holy Spirit, if it's not moving upon you to shout, then you don't need to shout. I believe in order and reverence because if we order and reverence, we're being led by the Holy Spirit completely. But look, yes, you will mature. We should be maturing to where we're using the gifts of the Spirit. But before that, all I want you thinking about now is that you should, that we should all desire the baptism, the power of the Holy Spirit for my individual benefit. It's an individual relationship. It's an individual walk with God. God is an individual God. He knows your name. He knows how many hairs on your head. He's concerned about detail. He's concerned about you. And he has given this great gift to make it available to help you with your walk with the Lord. It's not your answer for sin. Your answer for sin is keep my faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary. But it will rest and refresh and give you strength, continue to strengthen for that walk with God. Any questions? All right, if you'll stand, we'll be dismissed. Father, I love you tonight. And I'm grateful, God, for the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful that the power of the Holy Spirit still moves upon men and women today. God, with our faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary, Lord, that you still desire to use us to be witnesses unto you, God, in every area of our life and to everybody, that God, that we make contact to. Lord, tonight I pray for those that are here, those that are listening, I'm asking in the name of Jesus that you would give them a burning desire God, a burning desire in their heart for the baptism, for the power of the Holy Ghost. I pray, God, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to be all that we can be for you, that we can grow in relationship with you, and that we take advantage of this great gift, that we would have rest and refreshing. Though Satan would try to sift, and though trial and temptation would try to come upon us to be more than what we can bear, we have a way of escape, and I pray you give us a desire for that, Lord. Thank you, God, for these students. Thank you, God, Lord, for your word. And I pray that you would watch over us, keep us safe. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.